If you would with me, go ahead and pull out your Bibles and let's turn to the book of James. Uh, Josh mentioned at the beginning, shared some scripture with you. Uh, we're going to continue on in the series that we're in. We are walking verse by verse through the book of James and we are just kind of plugging away at it. This is week seven. And uh, we, a couple of weeks ago, we took a week off, and we'll do that here and there for some special messages uh, as the Lord leads. But we're going to, for the next few months, we'll just continue to plug our way through the book of James. And uh, James talks to us about having real faith and real life. And, uh, and I think we're seeing that he's laying a lot of groundwork through this scripture for us to understand more and more about what it means to really live out a tangible faith as believers. Um, to begin to be who we say we are, to uh, kind of put the rubber to the road, for lack of a better way to say it. And, and we're seeing that in these uh, scriptures. This morning, we're going to talk about the power of words, uh, taming the tongue. And I'll just go ahead, we'll just be honest in here um, before we get started. Anybody ever struggle with that? If you're not raising your hand, you're a liar. So that's, there you go. Th there's another sin, right? Um, taming the tongue. Can't tell you how many times in life things that I've said uh, have been the things that have gotten me in trouble when, when I've, uh, I've not guarded what I've said, when what I've said has not uh, been a result of, of, of growing spiritually and really seeing what God would have me to say. I mean, the, the tongue is a very powerful thing. Um, I, this is not meant to, uh, to, to, to gross anybody out, but Paul, could you put the picture up there? Uh, I, I just was... Uh, not the scripture, the picture. Oh, there it is. Okay, I'm looking back at the back. That's the, that guy right there, now that's a big old tongue. That's the Guinness Book of World Records, the world's widest tongue, right? And uh, I can see how you get my, uh, for some reason, I, 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 this may get too personal. I have a short tongue, and, and it, like it barely comes out of my mouth, but yet my tongue has gotten me in trouble so many times. All right, that's good enough. That's, we, we, we got that picture in our minds. It'll be, um, it'll be there for a long time. Um, James paints this uh, picture concerning the problem of, uh, of our tongues. And honestly, as we look at this, what we're really saying is that we're talking about our words, right? What, what comes out of our mouths, um, what we say, how we speak. You see, our words, our, our tongues, as James puts it, um, let's just get real here. What we say has, has, has broken many hearts. It has started more battles. It has brought more destruction in this world than we could possibly imagine, hasn't it? Yet we minimize, here's the thing, yet we minimize this issue. Um, we don't see it as a spiritual issue. But remember what James is doing here. James is talking to believers. These are Jewish converts who have come to know Christ. And now he's saying, you are, you're different now. You're a believer. So the things in your life need to change. It's what proves out that, that your relationship with Christ is real. And so when we take things like the, the way we say things or what we say, and we take kind of a sin like that and we begin to minimize it, um, then, then this is what James is, is touching on. I, I mean, here, here's what I'm saying. I, I don't think we look at our speech. We don't look at what we say, how we say it, where we say it, the tone in which we say it, our intentions in saying what we say, um, we don't look at that as too big of a deal um, compared to what we might call the big sins. Um, you know, the, that, that's, you know, that we might kind of, uh, infl you know, we might kind of say to ourselves, well, that's just not big compared to other things. Um, it surely couldn't be equated with murder or drunkenness or abuse or drug addiction or, or just outright evil hatred. So we tend to minimize some of these things that we call the little sins, uh, things like our speech. Um, but James is saying you can't do this as a, as a believer. There, like I said earlier, there are so many times, and I, I'm just being honest, that I have let my mouth mess things up. So many times I have realized that I said something that I shouldn't have said. Um, even though my tongue is rooted in my mouth, I realize that um, I've allowed my tongue to wag at both ends sometimes. H have you? 
I mean, I've realized that I've really messed it up sometimes, and so I've minimized it. Um, there are so many times that I've, I've done that. And, and my heart in this is to look at what James says. You know, and, and Jesus said it. I mean, it's all over the, it's all over the gospel. Uh, Matthew 12, verse 34, we won't have this on the screen, but you might just jot that verse down. Matthew 12, 34 says, um, it says this. Jesus said this. It says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you're taking notes this morning, um, I would say the first thing that we should enter into this as we look at this in James is to say that uh, the tongue is rooted in our hearts. The tongue is rooted in our hearts. In other words, what's going to come out of the mouth is connected to what's in the heart. Let's, let's start with where we've gotten to in James. Uh, James chapter 1 Verse 26, and this uh, we left off with verse 25 last time we met. James 1.26 says this. It says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. It's pretty, pretty straight up from James this morning. He is saying, He's saying, you know, if your heart's not right and your tongue is portraying that, if you're not able to bridle that, if you're not ever able to change that, then you are deceiving yourself. You're just playing a religious game. And, and what you're doing is, is worthless. Um, so, so what's in our heart ends up on our, on our tongues, coming out of our mouth, right, sooner or later. If you're, here's what I mean. If, you're, if your heart is filled with love, if you are, just like our church uh, vision statement, if you are loving God and loving people, and that results in you living the gospel, then that's, that's the right track, that's the biblical track. But if your heart is filled with love, it's going to be evident in what rolls off your tongue. If your heart is overwhelmed with grief, which happens sometimes because of life circumstances, then usually the tone of your words and what results from that is going gonna, is gonna to give that away. If your heart is consumed with jealousy and with hatred and with bitterness then your tongue's going to give it away. Um, typically, people who think they are hiding their feelings usually end up fooling themselves because usually what you say gives it away. Um, it's interesting how James, to, to me it's interesting how James portrays this issue that we all face. And we're, and we're going to read on this morning. We're going to skip around a little bit in James because this is not the only place he talks about this issue. We're going to see in James chapter 3, in just a second, and I'll go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. In James chapter 3, verse 8, James says that, James says that mankind, you know, you know, God set mankind in a different place than he did any, any of the rest of his creation. James says that, that man has been able to, to tame almost every kind of beast of the earth, um, but yet mankind has not learned how to control his own tongue. I mean, think about it. I mean, we can train tigers for a circus, and we can teach a bald eagle to fly around Jordan-Hare Stadium, but we can't control our own tongues. And, and James puts it this way so clearly today, and, and I don't think he means to say, look, you, you, we, can, we can do all this, but we can't control our tongue. I don't think he means to say that to give us this sense of hopelessness in all this, like, like we can't ever grow in this and we can't ever improve. Um, but I think he's given a clear warning that we need to be real careful about what we say and how we say it because your words can just about destroy anything. And so I think, he was, I think he was saying a word out of your mouth can accomplish just about anything and a word out of your mouth can just about destroy everything. And, and here is something else I think that comes to play in chapter 3. While we may kind of start getting what James is saying and we begin to restrain our tongues and think about more, uh, more about what we're saying and we try to guide that biblically and we want to honor God with what we say, there's a flip side to this. There's always another side of the coin. Sometimes even when we're growing in that, we're still guilty of not saying the things that we actually should say. And, and so both are equally important and, and, and James really hits on this this morning. Um, what we're talking about, this, we're, we're just talking about the, the, the mouth, the words, the tongue. It's mentioned nearly a hundred times in the Bible, and most often it is referring to the destructive power of our words, where our heart's not right, and we say things that don't honor God and, 
And um, for instance, uh, listen, listen, it's all over Scripture. Job chapter 15, verse 5, it says, Your sin prompts your mouth. You adopt the tongue of the crafty. That's what, that's what Job said. Job 20, verse 12, it says, Evil is sweet in his mouth, and he hides it under his tongue. In Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs 15, 4 said, A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Jeremiah 9, 8, it says the tongue is a deadly arrow. Life and death are found in what you say. So James is going on to say this. Here's, here's the problem, church. Maybe this is the crooks of the whole thing. Maybe this is really it. Here, here's the problem we deal with. Out of the same mouths that come praising, you know, we, we, we can praise God. Out of the same mouths that come praising also can come cursing. P- praising God one minute with our mouths and then cursing the next. And when I say cursing, I don't mean like cuss words. I don't mean like, not, not, not like my cousin, well, he cusses. That's not, what I'm, that's, what I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. Not that girl who used to be my friend, but she's got a dumpster mouth, so I don't like her anymore. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about praising and cursing it's, it's a, and it's a byproduct of a, of a bigger problem. James mean, means that you say praising things in one breath. You, you, you say the Christian things and, and praise God in one breath, but then it's easy to turn around and have a double standard where you're not honoring God with what you say and how you say it and the tone in which you say it. And, and, and really, it's a spillover of the heart. And so here's, the, here's, here's my hope this morning. This is one of those kind of sermons, and I told you last week as we were getting into this, now, now James starts to meddle a little bit. He, he's been real general so far, and now he's starting to meddle. He's saying, okay, if you are believers, if you are converts to Christ, if you are, if you are the church, if you are walking after Christ, then these specific things need to begin to conform themselves to the way of Christ and to his word. And so this is just kind of the first one. He's, he's saying, look, what you say has to, to honor God. If we're going to maintain a testimony and bring praise and glory to God, then we have to control what we say. We have to begin to ask questions. Are my words bringing glory to God? Or are they cursing words? Not cuss words. Are they cursing words? It's a, it's a bigger picture of, am I talking with anger? Do I gossip? Do, do I say what I say with malice? Am I discontent in the way I talk? Do I speak without thinking? Am I, am I not understanding what James had said earlier, that we should be quick to hear but slow to speak? Anybody ever mess that one up? I have. Do you know, are we lying? Do we speak with the intention of hurting someone else just to make ourselves look better or because it feels good to do that? Maybe it is cuss words. Maybe it is potty dumpster mouth. I don't know. There are all kind of ways that we can say things and have intentions of saying things that can be, as Nick Saban said, poison. It can be, it can be poison. And we have to ask, is it honoring God and does what I say point people toward Christ? If it doesn't, and we could probably just go to lunch on this, then we probably don't need to say it. So, a, a test of our love for God, this is just one of them that James is pointing out, is the manner of our speech. One of the ways to see that you really love the Lord is to look at the pattern of your mouth. Can we say with the psalmist, like he said in Psalm sixty-six, seventeen? His praise was on my tongue. Can can we say, like the psalmist said in Psalm 71, 24, my tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. Can we follow the wisdom of Solomon, who said the tongue of the wise brings healing? Does what you say bring healing to people? Proverbs 12, 18. Or Proverbs 15, 4, the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. Can, can we say with Samuel, like Samuel did in, in 2 Samuel 23, 2, he said, his word was on my tongue. Do you know God's word well enough that that's what begins to spill out? 1 Peter 3, 10, can we agree with Peter today when he said, whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. 
Turn over with me for just a second to James chapter 3. Because like I said, James 1.26 is not the only place. This beginning today, we begin to skip around a little bit in James. And by the time we finish, a few months from now, we will have covered every verse in here. But, but several times throughout James, he talks about the speech, the, the tongue. Look at James chapter 3. Obviously, it was an issue that James knew had to be addressed. Look at James chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, all the way to verse 12. Look, look at this. It says, If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a smaller member Yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. Look at this, a world of unrighteousness. James realized how, how big of a problem this is. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. If you're, if you're taking notes this morning, look, here's just a couple of things to think about here in light of James chapter 3 and what he's saying right here. And I'll just kind of keep these general. In dealing with our words, there are some fundamental truths, I think, that we see this morning. And I think this can resonate with all of us. I think the first thing we see here in James chapter 3 is that your words or your tongue, your words are a gauge. Your words or your tongue are a gauge. The tongue inevitably is a gauge of your spiritual maturity. In, a, in other words, our, here's what I'm saying. Our faith, go here with me, our faith will never register higher than our words, will it? Your words will give away the measure of your spiritual maturity. You, in, let me, real, real simple terms like this. You can act all Christian-y, but your words give away where your real spiritual maturity is. Your, your word shows where your heart is. The second thing I think we see here in James chapter 3 is that your tongue is a guide. Your tongue sets things in motion. Your, your tongue guides and steers relationships. Just, just like a steering wheel steers a car, what you say, your tongue, can tear down relationships as fast as you build them up. Your, your words can, can tear them down as fast as they got built up. It, it serves as a guide to, as to where your relationships go. The third thing that we need to see, and, and James says it very clearly here in chapter 3, is that your tongue is powerful. I don't think we realize how powerful our words are. Sometimes we just throw words out there and we think, well, that won't affect anything or anybody, or they shouldn't have taken it the way I said it, or I didn't really mean what I said. And all the while, we can really hurt people deeply. And it doesn't mean you're not honest with people. It doesn't mean you don't tell, God's, you don't, you don't tell people God's word. It doesn't mean that you're not straight up with people. But I think sometimes we just throw words out there and we don't realize how much they hurt, how much they cut, and how much they tear down. And how far away from biblical truth what we say is sometimes. The tongue is powerful. It's a strong force. We may not think what we say matters. But remember, what you say has the power to speak life or death into relationships. Fourth thing I think James is saying here is that your tongue reveals. Your, your tongue reveals. Let me, let me go back to Proverbs to kind of give you an example of what I mean by that. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Okay, if you guard your, guard your heart, it determines everything. And here, James provokes us to ponder whether or not our words reveal where our heart is, whether or not we have a good or a bad heart, a good or a bad course in life. And so the question to ask this morning is, do our words reveal a heart and maybe you just ask yourself sitting here, do my words reveal 
that I have a heart that's at peace with God and a heart that is desirous of honoring Him and bringing Him glory. Flip side of it is, do our words reveal a hypocrisy within our hearts? So the tongue gauges, it guides, it's powerful, it reveals. A bunch of people ask me why the bicycle was up here this morning. It's just a simple example. It was a little harder than I thought. I had a hard time getting it in the back of my truck this morning, putting it inside, but it, I think it's worth it because it, I, I want something that'll stick with us, that'll help us remember. So maybe just sitting here today, you say, well, that's not the greatest example I've ever seen, but hopefully we'll all remember it. It's just a reminder that the mouth is connected to the heart, just like with a bicycle and you have the pedals, okay? And imagine that's the heart. And imagine that the wheel, imagine that the wheel is the mouth. And you got the chain connected. So whatever the pedals do, then the wheel's going to do. And it reveals what's in your heart. And so maybe it's, just, maybe it's just, a, just one little reminder. The next time I'm starting to say something that's not going to honor God, I've got to say, you know, that's really what's in my heart. And it's connected. What's in my heart is going to come out of my mouth. Our, our mouth is, our, our, is driven by what preoccupies our hearts. And bridling our tongues, as James is talking about, means, here it is, church, it means fixing the heart first. So, so we've established that. I mean, you fix the heart first. James says later on, and we're not going here this morning, but James says later on in James 4, verse 7, we'll preach a whole different message on this, but he, he says something that's the key to all this. He, he, says you, he, he talks about submitting to God. Your mouth's not ever going to get right until you submit your heart to God. Change begins with submission. And it's like that with any particular sin. We begin to ask, Lord, what's wrong with my heart? I'm about to say something that totally doesn't honor you. I'm about to treat someone in a way that totally doesn't push someone toward Christ. But Lord, what would you have me say instead? What would you, or what would you just have me not say at all until I listen a little bit more? You'll see what I'm saying? I mean, it's connected to, to the heart. And we kind of go into, you know, kind of expository preaching mode here for a second. We were talking about that last week. And if you look all over James here, you begin to see it. He lays down these benchmarks. And, and what I mean by this, just, just flip with me for just a second here to a few verses. James 4. I mean, you're not going to have to go very far, but James 4, verse 11, gives one, another, one benchmark. He starts saying, okay, here's how you do it. Because it's good to say, well, I shouldn't use my mouth to dishonor God, but okay, well, then how do I start to, what are the things I need to be looking at? And he sets these benchmarks, like James 4, 11. That, that scripture says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. So what? There, there's just one benchmark he lays down right there. He's saying, okay, if you want to honor God with your mouth, then don't slander. D don't slander other brothers and sisters in Christ. Some, some of the worst usage of the mouth in 23 years of ministry, honestly, let's just be honest, I, I've seen it in 23 years of ministry, have been Christians slandering other Christians you know, in, in the church. And so he's saying, brothers, don't, don't do this in James 4.11. He's saying, don't slander fellow believers. He, he, uses, uh, he uses that word brothers. It, it literally refer, refers to the brethren, to other believers in the body of Christ. That's us. Don't slander fellow believers. And I'll be honest with you. I, 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 it, there's a lot of conviction that comes with standing up here and saying, talking about a particular sin and talking about we don't need to do this and realizing that, you know, I'm preaching, you know, I, I'm preaching to myself too. I don't know about you, but I think the times when I've been prone to slander other people and, and say, well, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about, or, you know, she's an idiot, or whatever, whatever it might be, I, I have to confess that probably if I were to take a step back and think about it, and I have at times, I've thought, when I do that, those are the times actually when I realize that I'm insecure. I, I'm insecure in my own faith and in where I'm at on, on, on how I feel, it, it reveals my own insecurity. In some, and I've convinced myself that in some morbid way, putting down another person helps me feel better about my miserable self. 
showing how little I understand about God's love for me. You ever been there? You realized, I just blew it with what I said, and, I, and I've done it before. And I realized, that's just a picture of how insecure I am and, and how my faith needs to grow. I didn't have to do that. I could have chosen to honor God, but I didn't because I'm so insecure that God can't handle this, so I've got to go add my two cents. And, and I've learned that the hard way, and I've had to go back at times and say, I messed up, and I shouldn't have said what I said. And I'm very sorry, and that didn't honor God. Uh, here's another benchmark. And this is not all of them. James just lays out two or three here. James chapter 5, verse 9. He says, okay, another way if you want to honor God with your mouth, he said, don't complain. Anybody know Mr. Complainer Guy? Yeah, anybody know that lady that complains about everything? Nobody, nobody likes Complainer Guy. He says, don't complain. James 5, 9, don't grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. That, that word grumble means complain. Listen, I have to learn sometimes. You know, the, the, I think that uh, instead of voicing my complaints, I need to just be honest with God a little bit more because he already knows my heart. God can handle my ranting. Um. And sometimes by telling him, I need to realize I don't have to tell others. I can take it to God, and he can, he can handle it. Um, God's sovereign over the cause of my complaints. Here's a third one, benchmark number three. Don't swear. Probably didn't see that one coming today. Another way to honor God with your mouth is not to, to, not to swear. And here again, I'm not talking about cussing. James 5.12 says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Boy, don't we need a good lesson in that? Let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. Don't be that wishy-washy guy that says one thing and does another. It sounds like Jesus is teaching in Matthew chapter 5, 34 and 37. Here's, here's what he said. He said, make no oath at all, either by heaven or by earth, but let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. Don't make oaths. Don't swear on it. Just be honest. Just be trustworthy. You see, the, the Jews in Jesus' day would have understood this very clearly. I mean, if you go and study their culture, they could hardly speak because of the culture and the religious system and what they had been taught, they could hardly speak without invoking oaths to give their statements credibility. And, and what I, you know, is kind of thing like, well, you know, my camel's the fastest camel in the land, and if it's not, then, then, then you know, then um, if my camel's not the fastest one, then may I die without children, you know, or, or whatever it, it may be. It was the way the culture worked, and it's the same for us. I mean, we've all... We've all heard this, you know, my daddy's stronger than your daddy. You know, we've all heard that. And if you don't believe me, then he'll come up here and whoop your daddy right now. I mean, we've all, we've all heard that. It's like the Andy Griffith show where the, where the spoiled kid who gets in trouble with Andy says, oh, yeah, well, my dad's going to come and show you. And then he comes up there to the office and Andy sets him straight. It, it's, it's the same for us. I mean, what I mean is that we similarly, we pad up our statements because we don't think we have enough personal gravity to just simply say yes or no. We've squirreled around things so many times that we can't say yes or no to people and them trust us and believe us. You know, and, and some, people, some people bolster what they say with, with, with I swear on it or, 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 or you, you just watch by God. I mean, people say it all kind of ways. My daddy's going to come up here and show you wordy exaggerations, threats, emotional displays. And so all throughout the book of James, he's saying, I can't tame my tongue on my own. I need the Lord to do this. And, he's all, and all through the book of James, he's saying, you know, the real problem, it, the tongue is just a result. The real problem is the heart. The real problem is the heart. It's the pedals. The real problem is the heart. All through the book of James, he's saying that. And he's saying that only with humble submission to Jesus Christ can I begin to get to the place that I need to be. So that's just a few benchmarks. Slandering, complaining, patting up our words to, 
to bolster our own sagging egos? It all begins in the heart. So we begin to start asking ourselves, if I have to question whether I should say what I'm about to say, then maybe I should hold off in saying it and seek God and give myself a heart check. Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. Proverbs 17, 28, Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. The, the, the chain, uh, you know, a bicycle chain can come off, but the chain connecting the heart to the tongue, that doesn't, that's, that's an unbreakable chain. For good or bad, it's always going to be there. So we begin to see, well, what are the biblical principles? Well, before you speak, pause and ask, why did I almost say that? What, what's my motive in saying what I about, <laughs> was about to say? And then honestly submit. Lord, I confess I was about to slander Mary because I'm jealous of her good looks. So I'm just not going to say it. Lord, I was about to gossip about Tom because I don't want him to succeed and I want to make myself look better. I want his job. You see, and maybe in those times of momentary silence where we have a chance to say something that we shouldn't say and maybe we just pause and we don't say it, I know that can be a little bit awkward and invite stares from friends when there's awkward silence. And they say, well, well, why are you doing that? Well, just simply tell them I'm confronting my sins right now. If anyone thinks he's religious, James 1.26, where we started, and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, that person's religious, religion is worthless. Well, let's, just, let's just shoot straight. People, people are sensitive and... Sometimes it's the little things that hurt the most, but as believers, we got to think about what we, we say. It's kind of like a tiny shoe and a tiny rock in your shoe. It's like a, it's like a splinter. Y'all know splinter. I think I can talk about it. My youngest son, Jake's not in here. He went to kid, okay, thank you. My youngest son, Jake, went, is over in kids' worship. And uh, he got this splinter like three weeks ago. It was a little splinter in his finger. And I thought, I thought the kid was going to die. I literally thought he was going to die. You know, I mean, he can get smacked in the face and he's all right, but he's got this splinter, and, she, and I take him in there, and Sharon's got a needle, and he just, he started, he started hyperventilating. I mean, he was a needle. He's like, no, no, you know, just, just going crazy. He was like, we haven't even touched you with the needle yet. And then she's kind of, you know, pricks around on it a little bit, and he's screaming all the while, and then she's done, and he's still screaming, don't touch me with the needle. We're like, we've already gotten the splinter out. It's just going, going nuts. I mean, it, it's, you know, our words can be like a splinter under the skin. And, and here's, here's the thing. We, we might want to say to people, well, don't be so sensitive. But you've got to realize as believers, people, one, remember he's talking to believers, but one as the church, we've got to realize there are a lot of lost people out there that what they need to hear is the word of God and they need to hear and see what Jesus is like. But then in the church, you got to realize that, that there are people on different planes spiritually. And, and some people are learning this and some haven't. And so if you're a mature believer, not that you're perfect, but if you're growing in this and God's convicting you about this, then realize someone else may not be there yet. And, and so your words matter. And you may help teach, you may disciple another believer and help another believer realize that what they say matters. Listen, James Dent said this. This was, this was from Reader's Digest. He said, as you go through life, you're going to have many opportunities to keep your mouth shut, take advantage of all of them. And here's the deal. Listen, church, it would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be nice if we got saved and then we didn't sin anymore. It would be nice if conversion resulted in a total makeover of the mouth. But it's just not so. Even though we become new creatures in Christ, like 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, we also carry around with us the old nature or the flesh which wars against the spirit that's now within us. That's what Galatians 5.17 says. And the tongue is one of the major battle, battlegrounds in the war, and that's what James is saying. He said, it is so small, it's a small part of the body, but you don't realize the big consequences that it has. So to become godly people, we have, to, we have to wage war 
on that front. And, 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 and what we realize here as we keep going through James is that James is a pretty savvy pastor who knows that we won't gear up for the battle and face our own sins of the mouth, of the tongue, of our words, unless we recognize the magnitude of the problem. If we say, well, that's just one of the little sins, and God's probably okay with it, and that's just who I am, and that's my personality, and that's the way I am, and it's just the way I'm going to be. And we're justifying it. And we're all the time pointing to others who are notoriously bad. Well, I say a few things, but boy, she really does have potty mouth, or man, he gossips all the time, or whatever it is. And we point to other people's sins, and we don't recognize our own then we're not seeing what James is saying. I mean, he's, he's opening up these vivid illustrations to open our eyes and say, this is a serious problem, you've got to look at it. To, to tame the terrible tongue, we must recognize the tremendous magnitude of the battle we face. And, and, here's, the, and here's what's hard about this, and let's just be honest as, as we move toward wrapping this up. It would be nice if James gave us a list of helpful hints about how to fix this, but he doesn't. If you read through James, he's just all he, he's identifying the problem over and over. And maybe it's because most of us, just an, just an example, just like an alcoholic, become to get to a place where we're in denial about the magnitude of the problem. And so James is over and over just saying, "Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here's the problem." Um, I, I coached a little third grade basketball team this year and I told the boys in practice I, I want to be a good coach for you I want to encourage you I want to build you up your, your, your third graders but I want you to understand that every time we have practice I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you what you're doing wrong what you're doing wrong and, I, and that's not fun to hear but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what you're doing wrong and the reason I'm going to do that is because if you don't understand what you're doing wrong you'll never know what you need to do to do what's right. And I don't think they liked that sometimes. Sometimes they, they got it. Um, but I think that's what James is, is doing. He's saying, no human being can tame the tongue, James 3, 8. And remember, it's impossible. He's got a, he, he says in James 3, 9, with, with the tongue we bless the Lord and the Father, and with the same tongue we curse people, and we don't honor God with it. It's a big problem. And he's saying it all begins in the heart. And until the heart changes, and that's real general. It's not like a list of do this, do this, do this, do this, and it'll be fixed, and then you'll be honoring God. He said, no, it all begins with where your heart is. That's the only way. Josh read some scripture before we started. Um, it says in Psalm 141, verse 3, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Listen, we're going to sing one more song before we go this morning. And I hope that's our, our heart cry this morning. I hope that we take James uh, at, at what he says and that we realize that until we set a watch before our mouths, until we realize that uh, we need God to keep the door, right? That we need God to be the, the, the watchman over the door of our mouths, that it goes back to the heart and where the heart is, that this will never, um, that this will never be right. Remember, James said this. He said, How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. No human being can do it. It takes God. And listen, let's take a step back. Before we close out today, let's take a step back. This is one particular sin talking to believers about if you're a believer, then this is something that needs to conform to the way of Christ. You can't do that. You can't even begin to do that if you're not a believer. So it all starts with this. If you don't know Jesus Christ, then you have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And nobody can do that for you. God, God has to save you. God has to conform your life God has to come into your life and transform you and change you make you from in, from being a lost person into a saved person a person with no hope into a person that has all the hope he ever needs for life and it only comes through Christ the Bible says no man comes unto the Father unless he comes through Jesus Christ our Lord there is one way to know God and that is through Jesus Christ 
relationship with him. So what I'm trying to say is you certainly can't ever do this if you don't know Jesus. This is just a symptom. This is just one sin that we're talking about this morning. So I would invite you this morning, listen, if you're sitting here and saying, well, I, you know, I, I'd like to do that. I'd like to be better in my speech, but I don't even know Jesus. You've got to know Jesus first. And if you are a believer this morning, I do know Jesus. I do have a relationship with Jesus, but I'm struggling in this area, and it's not honoring God, and I can't, I'm not even doing this well with my family or with my friends or at work, much less being able to share the gospel with someone else because they're not able to see who I am in Christ because my words don't match who I say I am. Maybe that's where you are this morning. Then Maybe that's something you just need to get with God about and say, Lord, change my heart. Fix my heart. Listen, we're going to sing one more song before we go. You're always invited. We're always here to counsel with people. If you need to talk with someone about how to have a relationship with Christ or just pray with someone and know it's not, we're, it's not going to be broadcast to the world and just confidentially someone to pray with, come and tell us. Uh, if you want to come and pray at the altar while we sing, you're always welcome to do that. Listen, let's, let's stand. Let's sing one more song before we go this afternoon.